Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening and welcome to the World Affairs Council World Affairs Today Foreign Policy Series program, Japan, Can the Land of the Rising Sun Rise Again? We have a great set of panelists um, and so we'll go right into that. I will just introduce Thomas Reckford. Mr. Reckford is the president of the Malaysia America Society, a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and the regional director for East Asia at the National Leadership Forum on Global Challenges. Previously, he was senior international analyst at the Eaton Corporation, vice president of Intermatrix Incorporated, a senior advisor to the Government Research Corporation, and an analyst in the Office of National Estimates at the CIA. He is also Vice Chairman of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C., and he will moderate tonight's program. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel and, and Mr. Reckford. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Uh, tonight for what promises to be quite a wonderful program. Uh, since World War II, Japan has gone through a number of distinct phases. First, there was uh, the recovery with substantial U.S. assistance. Then there was phenomenal economic growth through exports from the 1960s until the 1980s under the leadership of the Liberal Democratic Party. But in the last 20 years, there has been uh, economic and political stagnation despite the rise to power of the Democratic Party of J Japan, the DJP, in 2009. Despite growing security threats in the region and two decades of economic problems, Japan seems unable to set a course of decisive foreign policy and economic reform. Rosy predictions that the DJP's electoral victory would improve Japan's leadership were dashed by policy stumbles and the revolving door of prime ministers. Can, can Japan inject new life into its economy and take a leading role in the Asia-Pacific region commensurate with its economic might? Given J China's rise, how will Japan cope with a new security environment? When will Japan's government be strong enough to implement much needed changes at home? To help us answer these questions and many more, we are lucky to have two of America's best informed experts on Japan. I'll begin with our first speaker, uh, Michael Green, who is uh, a senior advisor and Japan chairholder at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as being an associate professor of international relations at Georgetown University. He previously served as special assistant to the president for national security affairs and senior director for Asian affairs at the National Security Council. He speaks fluent Japanese and spent over five years in Japan working as a staff member of the National Diet. Quite unusual for an American. He's been a journalist for Japanese and American newspapers, and he's been a consultant for U.S. business. He graduated from Kenyon College and received his master's and Ph.D. from SICE at Johns Hopkins. Kent Calder, who will speak after Mike, is director of the Reischauer Center for East Asia Studies at SAIS and director of the Japan Studies program there as well. He's a, taught at Princeton as a 
full professor for 20 years. He also uh, held the Japan chair at CSIS back when I was there in, in the late 80s. That's when I first got to meet Kent. He's a former lecturer in the Department of Government at Harvard University and served as the first executive director of Harvard's program on U.S.-Japan relations. Like Mike, he has a lot of experience in Japan. He was special advisor to two U.S. ambassadors uh, to Japan, uh, Ms. Mondale and Foley. Uh, he's the former special advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, including Korea. And he has his PhD in government from Harvard. Uh, as you can see, these are two marvelously equipped people to talk to all of you about Japan. Mike, would you be first? Uh, thanks, Tom. Thank you all. And uh, thank you, uh, Kent. Uh, it's uh, nice to see the World Affairs Council focused on Japan. It's nice to be on the panel with Kent, who is my uh, senpai, my senior. And of course, we, if we were doing this the Japanese way, I wouldn't be speaking first. <laughs> um, but it's better this way. He'll clean up my mistakes. Um, I was doing my uh, uh, graduate work and working in the Japanese diet in the late 1980s. Um, and at that time, Americans thought that Japan was going to take over the world, much the way we talk about China today. In 1988, for example, there was a survey done in the United States, this is still during the Cold War, where more Americans thought that Japan was a threat to the United States than the Soviet Union, and this was still during the Cold War. And Dick Gephardt, when he ran for Congress that year, famously quipped that the U.S. and the Soviets fought the Cold War and Japan won. <laughs> And I always felt, and I'm sure Kent did at the time too, that um, people who didn't know Japan were vastly inflating the threat that Japan represented to the United States and to the world, um, misunderstanding our common interests and values, and missing some of the, some of the weaknesses in Japan's um, economic development. And in a similar way today, I think we're sort of on the opposite side of the coin. We're going in the other direction. Um, news about Japan is all doom and gloom. Uh, we tend to uh, overestimate Japan's challenges and underestimate Japan's strength and often forget how important Japan is to the world and to the United States. In an odd way, I thought that the March 11th uh, triple disaster, the earthquake, the tsunami, and then the nuclear uh, meltdown, because it was a meltdown at Fukushima uh, power plant, in an odd way that showed, uh, if you looked, both some of Japan's unique challenges today, but also some of Japan's unique strengths. The challenges were evident when you saw things like um, the average age of the victims, uh, well over 55. Um, 25,000 people were killed or missing, many of them elderly. It wasn't just because the elderly had a harder time escaping. It's because Japan has um, one of the fastest aging societies in the world today. It's a major challenge. The birth rate in Japan now is, is, is uh, higher only than Korea, Singapore, and Macau. <coughs> um, and so uh, demographics are a major burden. When you have people retiring, you have to pay for their pensions and their welfare, and you have fewer people going into the workforce. And you could see a snapshot of that in the demographics of the victims in, in this tragedy on March 11th. Um, Japan has over an over 200 percent debt to GDP ratio. Um, and the cost estimates for the recovery from the 11 um, are quite staggering, hundreds of billions of dollars. And it highlighted um, that problem that Japan faces. Um, energy. Japan has always been a country uh, devoid of natural resources. Um, today, Japan imports roughly 99 percent of its oil from abroad, um, almost all of that from the Gulf, not the most stable region of the world. Japan relied on and hoped to move up uh, its reliance on nuclear energy. It was roughly a third of power generation. <coughs> um, uh, they'd hoped to go to about 50 percent, but after the Fukushima disaster, uh, there are questions about whether Japan can even retain 20 percent nuclear power, which means even more reliance on oil and LNG <coughs> and renewables, but that's a limited uh, option. And March 11th also highlighted um, and really exacerbated the Japanese public's 
declining faith in their political leaders. And this is a problem in many parts of the world, but it's become a particularly acute in Japan with a new prime minister every year <coughs> with very low popularity ratings for all the major parties. On the other hand, March 11th showed some of Japan's unique resilience, unique strength. <coughs> um, I think the one that was most noticed around the world was the orderly way in which the Japanese public responded. Um, I have a Navy pilot friend, a helicopter pilot, who had been in disaster uh, relief operations in Pakistan and in Indonesia and around the world. And he said when they flew in to provide supplies in northern Japan and Tohoku, he couldn't believe what he saw because usually once people see the helicopters bringing aid, there's this mad rush. And then they need security on the ground to clear a place so the helicopters can land, and then there's another mad rush. Well, he said in Japan, all of the people were waiting in a disciplined line. When the helicopter landed, they all bowed, and then they took turns helping to unload the supplies. And I think you saw examples of that again and again after March 11th. I was on a Chinese TV show um, in June where they were talking about the disaster, and I was sort of a guest commentator from the United States. And the Chinese commentators were saying, uh, if this had been China, there would have been mass chaos. <laughs> and I had to confess, although I hated to do it, if it had been the United States, there's a chance there would have been mass chaos uh, as well. Um, the earthquake tilted Japan. It moved Japan, and it tilted Japan. And it sank about 10 feet of the Japanese coastline and areas. And the tsunami was the highest in recorded history. <clears throat> 25,000 people dead or missing is a lot. But if this had been almost any other country in the world, particularly um, with respect to the earthquake, uh, it's hard to imagine any other country in the world being as prepared or as equipped in terms of structural engineering, civil engineering, to deal with it. In fact, if there had been no tsunami, if it had just been the earthquake, it would have been one of the biggest in recorded history in Japan, and the casualties probably would have been in the dozens or hundreds at most. Um, the tsunami, the, the combination was overwhelming. And so people, when, when they look at this, disaster relief experts, including people I know who were involved in Katrina um, and other disasters, they marveled, actually, at how well-prepared the Japanese were in civil engineering and civil defense. In an odd way, the fact that you could not buy Toyotas and Hondas, I was shopping for a new Honda right around this time, uh, you couldn't buy one um, because there was such an interruption. Uh, only about less than 3% of Japan's GDP is, is in the affected area of Tohoku in the north but critical elements in the global supply chain. Um, and so Toyota couldn't meet demand in the U.S. Honda couldn't meet demand in the U.S. I met with a Korean executive who will go unnamed in manufacturing who told me quite candidly that his board asked him to look at um, cutting off Japan, which provided key components for his manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And they looked at it and they decided it'll take us five years to catch up to the Japanese in these key components. Um, and by then, they will have easily recovered. And in fact, the supply chains were restored much uh, faster than people expected, within, in most cases, weeks or months. Shows you how important Japan is in the global supply chain. Uh, when you peel open most high technology components now built in Korea or China, there's a Japanese chip or Japanese component that is indispensable. Um, I think Kent's going to say more about that. The self-defense forces, who knew? Um, 100,000 Japanese military mobilized within 48 hours to provide rescue operations. 100,000 within 48 hours. In Japanese polls today, the most trusted institution in Japan is the military. This from a country that has a pacifist constitution, Article 9 outlaws the right of war. Uh, remarkable um, strength and professionalism in the SDF. Um, some of the self-defense forces who were ordered to go into the nuclear reactor or to fly over it to drop water in it were told, uh, some of you won't make it, and they all volunteered. It's not what you think of when you think about the Japanese military today. It was quite impressive. And then our alliance, um, although Japan took the lead for obvious reasons, we sent 20,000-plus Marines, sailors, uh, airmen, um, army, 20-plus uh, ships in what's called Operation Tomodachi. Um, and uh, our alliance moved very quickly. Our Chinese friends, I was in Beijing and heard a lot of questions about how it was that the U.S. Marines and Air Force and the Japanese Self-Defense Forces rebuilt Sendai Airport in about four days. It had been completely devastated. I, I should have brought pictures. You can find them online. Completely devastated, not even recognizable as an airport. It was operating, and Australians and others were flying in supplies in about four days after they landed and started repairing it. And as one 
um, Chinese uh, uh, counterpart I know in the PLA said, that's pretty impressive battlefield recovery. Mm -hmm. um, the strength of our alliance was noticed. And then, of course, the massive outpouring of sympathy and support for Japan is a reminder there's a reason why in the British Broadcasting Company, BBC's annual polls around the world of what country people respect the most, Japan is almost always first, second, at worst, third, um, since they've been doing these polls the last decade or so. So it's a reminder of why Japan's important to the world and why Japan's important to us. Um, just a few factoids on, um, to sort of counter the prevailing doom and gloom about Japan sinking into the Pacific. Uh, Japan is the second largest contributor to almost all the major international institutions we rely on, the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations system. Japan's the second largest contributor after us to Afghanistan. Japan is, after all, still the third largest economy. The Japanese consumer market is twice the size of the Chinese consumer market. So if you're Louis Vuitton or Coca-Cola, <laughs> you're eyeing China with an awful lot of hope and expectation, but you're making your money in Japan uh, for a lot of these companies, and will be for some time. Uh, the Japanese stock market's been pretty anemic, but someone in the business community pointed out to me recently, if you just take the top 30 Japanese performers, the way we do basically in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, their stock performance is actually higher than it was at the height of the Japanese economic bubble or economic performance in the late 1980s. Um, so there are some real strong international companies in Japan. And Japan's important to the U.S. for all those reasons. We have, as a matter of U.S. national strategy since the war, but the roots go back to Commodore Perry and even um, uh, the first U.S. naval officer to go into the Pacific in 1813, um, David Porter on the USS Essex, who was going to the Pacific to raid British whalers, sank 300 British ships. <coughs> um, he came back in 1815 and said, this place, Japan, we're going we're gonna to need to anchor our presence in the Pacific someday on this country. Um, uh, repeated by Commodore Matthew Perry, Alfred Thayer Mahan, and our post-war strategy essentially was based on making sure we were on side with Japan uh, in the Pacific and globally. And it's, it's important in terms of all the things I mentioned. It's important with the rising China to maintain a stable balance, not containment of China, but a stable balance. It's important because Japan hosts um, almost 50,000 U.S. forces. Our whole presence in that whole part of the world depends on Japan. Um, and because, as I found in the White House, we agree with Japan on almost everything now. It's almost, in some ways, boring. It's part of the problem Japan has. We agree with Japan. In fact, when I was in the, in the NSC, in the White House, 2001 to the end of 2005, to be honest, in the G7 meetings and these international meetings, we had more problems with the British sometimes than we did with <laughs> Japan. For example, in development assistance, we were more in line with the, with the Japanese than we were with Britain. <coughs> um, so the question is, can Japan revitalize? And let me just touch on a few areas where I think Japan has untapped strengths and could. Um, trade. Um, Korea, for example, um, is doing quite well economically. The past few years, it's really boomed. One of the secrets is that Korea is signing a lot of free trade agreements and economic partnership agreements to reduce barriers and also to basically force on themselves a restructuring and more competitive uh, a Korean economic policy. About 35, 36 percent of Korea's overall trade is covered under these free trade agreements. Uh, for Japan, about 16 percent, uh, uh, less than half, of their international trade is covered by free trade agreements. So one area of untapped strength for Japan is if Japan started cutting deals, lowering barriers, um, it would add dynamism to the Japanese economy. And of course, as many of you know, the Japanese government has expressed its interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, which we're in. Uh, Malaysia, um, about nine countries. If Japan joined TPP, this free trade agreement across the Pacific, the U.S. and Japan would account for 90 percent of the economic activity. Uh, it would basically be a U.S.-Japan FTA. It is no coincidence that once Japan expressed interest in this, the Europeans and the Chinese started asking for trade agreements, too. So this is an area Japan has underperformed because of agriculture. Very hard to open the agriculture market, but, but real potential. Um, another one is women. Um, this is my wife's area of expertise, but to give you one figure, Goldman Sachs uh, calculated, um, I don't know how they did it, but they make a lot of money, so they must be right. Uh, <laughs> Goldman Sachs calculated that if Japan had um, participation in the workforce by women uh, at a level comparable to the average of, in, of, of the OECD countries, of the advanced industrial democracies, in terms of promotion, staying in the workforce, and so forth, that it would add 
uh, 0.33 percentage points to GDP. So if, so if they had a 1.5 percent GDP growth figure, it would be one. Uh, it would go. It would. If they had 1.2 percent, it would go to 1.5 percent. It would add a nice chunk of energy to a Japanese economic growth. And the Japanese leadership knows this. It's a hard public policy problem. Um, you know, you're trying to get the birth rate up. You're trying to get women in the workforce more. That's a tough public policy problem. But but it's 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 a an untapped area of strength. Um, Japan's defense policy, Japan is, depending on how you count, the fifth, sixth largest defense spender in the world. The Maritime Self-Defense Forces, also known as the Japanese Navy, um, <laughs> but not called that because of the Constitution, uh, is now larger than the Royal Navy that once ruled the seas. Um, the defense budget's flat because Japan's economic growth is slow. Um, but um, you can do a lot with smart defense policy. So the Japanese, for example, um, have banned for many decades participating in international um, consortia to build new weapons or new fighters, and they don't export weapons. Well, they just changed that. They just changed the so-called three arms export principles. So now when we develop with Britain and Italy a jet fighter, Japan can be part of that. Or if Japan wants to take some of its old frigates and destroyers and sell them to Indonesia and the Philippines to help with security in the Pacific, they can now do that. Mm. Um, so these kinds of restrictions on defense, um, as they come off um, in a reasonable way, can give more security power. And then one final other area I'd mention is um, in the international relations theory that I teach and Kent teaches and others, you learn that when you have a rising power like China, a uh, country has several options. You can bandwagon, basically say, game over, <laughs> we're with you, and switch your allegiance and join that rising power. You can try to stay neutral, which is hard. You can counterbalance them by what's called internal balancing, building up your military. Hard for Japan to do because the economy is not growing, but there are some options. Or you can do what's called external balancing, which means linking hands with other countries in the region that are similarly worried about the shifting balance of power. And that's precisely what Japan has quietly been doing the past four or five years. Japan has had a formal treaty and alliance with us since 1960, revision of a treaty a decade before that. In 2007, they signed a security agreement with Australia. And then in 2008, they signed a security agreement with India. What did India and Australia have in common with Japan? Well, sushi and samosa are different, so it, it ain't <laughs> food. Uh, they're maritime powers that have trading relations with China but are a little bit worried about the balance of power and want to do more together to make sure they can maintain it. So these are all things Japan is and in some places, cases could do. So the key question really, and we probably will spend time talking on this, is can Japanese politics get out of the rut they're in now? We have a different prime minister. Um, it's gotten so bad that even Japan experts have trouble remembering the names. Uh, when you have a different prime minister every year since uh, Junichiro Koizumi left office, it's hard to get political leadership and, and direction and get your hand around some of these tough problems. Um, I'm generally optimistic. I think Japan is in the midst of a transition, not in a new normal or a new rut in politics that will last. Historically, Japanese institutions are slow to change. The Japanese culture is conservative. Historians point out that the black ships of Commodore Perry arrived in 1853, and, and it took decades to build a new constitution and, and do the major restoration. In a fundamentally conservative society, elite change is how change happens, not so much from below, and institutions therefore change slowly. For a long time, the LDP, as Ken has written about in some of his books, dominated, the Conservative Party dominated because they had growth in the economy and they distributed. And the quip was Japan was the only communist country that worked. <laughs> in 1990, that didn't work anymore. The stock market collapsed and Japan had a lost decade of almost no growth. Koizumi came in, the prime minister with the wild lion's mane of hair, good friend with my old boss, George Bush, and he basically, in effect, said, I'm going to choose growth. And he focused on reform, restructuring, and growing the economy. And it was painful, but it played well. He was pretty popular. Um, but the Gini coefficient, the gap between rich and poor in Japan, also grew. So he erred on the side of growth over distribution. The DPJ came in and said, literally, we're going to stop Koizumi's neocon economics, and we're going to focus on distribution. And a large part of their platform was literally giving money out to people. You want to have a child, we'll give you $3,000. You don't want to pay taxes for, for school fees, you don't have to pay. You don't want to pay highway taxes, you don't have to pay. They went back to distribution. Didn't work. 
didn't work. It, it, was, it was, uh, sounded good in theory, but it was unsustainable. Um, and so now the debate is going back to the center more. What's the right balance of growth and distribution? And I think NOTA, the current prime minister, is leaning towards, quite frankly, growth. Um, and in some ways, that's what free trade agreements are about, is, um, is moving away from protection towards more dynamism. But that's hard for a Japanese society that has had a compact for decades where you would have both growth and distribution. And I think um, this is going to be a debate. And we're going to see maybe a few more prime ministers before it's settled. But I think the debate, because Japan has always, in the end, historically, reconfigured its institutions to compete internationally. I think in the end, uh, we're going to have uh, leadership evolve that, um, that focuses on restoring dynamism. That said, it's an open question. Um, I've spent a lot of time learning Japanese. I'm not eager to suddenly have to learn Chinese now. So <laughs> I'm watching with bated interest, and we'll, and we'll see how it goes. Thanks. Ken, uh, the floor is, is all yours. Thank you, Tom, and it's uh, good to see uh, Mike again. I always find our uh, discussions interesting, and we, I think we both, I hope that we both learn something. Uh, and it's good to see all of you uh, to talk about a subject that uh, means a lot to me personally, having spent 11 years in Japan and gone back and forth across the Pacific and engaged it with Japan for my, my pretty much my entire career. Our topic today, of course, is whether the land, land of the rising sun can rise again. And as I began to think about that uh, subject, my mind went back uh, to uh, early April when I was over in Tokyo and uh, decided to take a trip uh, up to Tohoku. It was just a day or two after they restored the air service uh, to Sendai. And we arrived in Sendai and uh, I looked around and the, at the fence around the airport there were a couple of cars turned upside down and all sorts of junk still there and bulldozers and uh, there were no windows of course the earthquake had taken those out uh, there was only one floor of the airport uh, operating but there were sunflowers all over inside pictures of sunflowers gambaro um, let's Let's go to it. Um, the, one of the people at the um, air, airport desk that uh, checked me in, uh, had her family was from Ishinomaki, uh, up the coast about uh, 30 or 40 miles. Uh, and I looked at the paper and, and uh, where the, the uh, destruction seemed to have been bad. And I was interested in getting a picture of what had happened and decided to, to go up to Ishinomaki. Um, along the coast, uh, the road was, uh, was passable, but almost the only things that you saw on the roads were uh, heavy vehicles. Uh, getting to Ishinomaki itself, it was just like a war zone. I, uh, I haven't ever seen anything in, the, like, in Japan like that. Uh, almost all of the vehicles there were uh, military in drab, uh, military gray, and and olive, and uh, uh, it was it was an experience that certainly I won't forget. I've been back to Japan many times. I get there as Mike does uh, every uh, few months, and there's uh, there's a striking uh, change that's occurred. Um, across Sendai and many of the places of Tohoku uh, since last March, since that uh, terrible uh, March 11th. Um, it's a tribute to Japanese determination, to Japanese resilience. Um, damage was close to $300 billion, 20 times the scale of Katrina. As Mike said, 25,000 lives lost, uh, and yet, um, Tohoku and also Japan are uh, steadily recovering. I think in our mandate here today is to think about where Japan is headed now. Um, the short answer, I think there's no question that uh, Japan is recovering, that there's been remo uh, remarkable resilience. Um, 
to have a sense for the longer term, for where ultimately uh, the country is headed. I think one, uh, perhaps to complement uh, what Mike said earlier, it's also uh, useful to go back to history and to think about the large uh, process of transformation uh, which is going on in Japan, both in its domestic uh, politics and economics and also in its relationship to uh, surrounding Asia and also uh, to the world. The bottom line, it seems to me, if one does look through that, and I do want to go through some of the details, is that uh, the challenges are tremendous. They require a new activism, um, much more uh, pronounced than what Japan uh, has uh, experienced in uh, previous years. Uh, the country, I think, particularly in partnership with the United States and other uh, key allies is capable of it, but the challenge is a very significant one and in many ways a counterintuitive one. Um, first of all, there's, I'd like to divide this basically up into uh, four challenges that I think uh, Japan confronts today. First of all, uh, there's the production challenge. Getting back, getting the areas that uh, uh, were damaged, uh, decimated back on their feet. Um, in terms of the aggregate uh, share of Japan as a whole, Tohoku is not uh, that large a share. Its share of Japanese GDP was only 2.5%. Uh, but as Mike also mentioned, uh, in some areas uh, such as autos and electronics, um, Tohoku does play important roles in the supply chain of Japan. Uh, the production challenge that uh, Japan has faced as a result of the earthquake I think is clear uh, in some of the figures that one has for uh, 2011 as a whole and then also for uh, the latest, January 2012. Just um, this last month, Japan's exports were down about 9.3%. And what was declining? Autos, um, electronic uh, components were uh, the main uh, areas. And this results from this sort of dislocation that I had mentioned earlier. Japan has been extremely good precisely because its organization is so strong in assembly and processing, automobiles, electronics, uh, aircraft uh, components. And even if only small uh, parts were missing, of course this uh, created, uh, contributed to confusion more generally. One of the reasons the Japanese auto industry, some of the um, major um, models had to slow down was because uh, some components that released airbags were uh, made by a very small number of suppliers in Tohoku, uh, just as, as one example. Um, but, of course, that production challenge uh, is moving toward uh, resolution. Uh, the IMF estimated that in 2011, Japan lost about 2.3 percent of production due to the uh, tsunami and to the earthquake, but that in 2012, it will recover about 1.1 percent, so the net is Japan is moving, of course, with the production increases back to uh, toward normal. Uh, there are other important challenges, however. Uh, the energy challenge that Mike alluded to a bit, I'd like to talk about in just a little bit more detail. Um, that one is something that is potentially important and potentially a significant constraint on Japan going forward. Uh, in, again, in uh, 2012, the, the latest, in January's figures, we can see some indication of this. Year on year, LNG, liquefied natural gas, imports into Japan were up about 74 percent compared to uh, January of 2011, which was just before uh, the tsunami. Uh, petroleum imports were up 13 percent. That was largely the result of just price increases internationally. 
and the actual volume of petroleum imports was down. But the, um, the LNG, as Japan shifted from nuclear power with uh, only four or five of its nuclear plants, it's 54 plants still operating, as those plants are set st steadily shut down that uh, produce around 30 percent of Japan's nuclear power, um, the country has to rely more and more, of course, on uh, non-nuclear facilities, on particularly on LNG. And so uh, that's led to a very large surge in imports. The combination of the production challenge that I mentioned and the energy challenge, that of having to import to find LNG and other sorts of production, um, has meant has been, those factors together have been right at the heart of the fact that in 2011, for the first time uh, since 1979, the first time uh, since the second oil shock, uh, the Japan's uh, trade uh, balance was in deficit. The country that's had such a huge that, of course, for many years across the 1990s, had by far the largest uh, surpluses in the world. Uh, in uh, 2011, had a uh, a trade uh, current account uh, uh, deficit uh, for the first time in the in many many years. There are other challenges uh, still looming. The fiscal challenge. Um, Japan's debt, as Mike mentioned, is over 200% uh, of of GDP, um, and rebuilding costs already. The Diet has allocated over $230 billion to rebuilding. I mentioned the, ma the massive costs, close to $300 billion of the for rebuilding. The Diet, of course, has been very quick at uh, moving toward new construction. And of course, that will have many pluses. It, uh, easy to introduce a lot of new technology, a lot of uh, smart technology, smart grids, um, uh, more and more energy efficient homes. There's a lot of possibilities that are coming about through this construction, but um, the construction is expensive. Um, Japan, as it ages, is moving to the point where uh, within two, three, five years, it won't, and without uh, some major shifts in its fiscal position, it won't be able to uh, fund its own national debt domestically and will have to rely increasingly on international markets, which of course it could potentially um, expose it to the sort of uh, turbulent financial situation that uh, many of the European countries have faced uh, recently also. Now, the last uh, challenge, I've talked about a production challenge, that's the short run, the energy challenge, the fiscal challenge. Another one that's more subtle, but I think certainly uh, we need to think about and debate uh, more and more that is, is uh, facing Japan in the future. It's what I would call uh, the challenge, an embedded challenge, the challenges that flow from history from the location that Japan has for historical reasons in the international system and the ways in which uh, globalization and uh, I international change, the rise of China, the rise of other Asian nations, is eroding the original um, privileged in some ways and relatively secure and stable position that Japan had in the world. Uh, uh, one aspect of this, of course, has been something that I know uh, both Mike and I believe in very, very strongly and that I believe will continue, but uh, which faces some significant challenges, namely uh, the uh, stability and the nature of the U.S.-Japan uh, relationship as it's currently configured. In 1951, uh, when the security treaty between our two countries uh, was originally signed. Um, Korea was in the midst of a war. Uh, China was under embargo. Southeast Asia uh, was colonized. Japan stood alone in the Pacific as the only other uh, major nation 
together in partnership with the United States. And of course, uh, we continue to see it as a key ally, as a cornerstone of the American position in, and the uh, democratic nations in the Pacific. That said, there's been tremendous change in Asia, much of it very fortunate, uh, the rise of democracy and a vibrant economy in Korea, um, a tremendous transformations of various kinds in Southeast Asia. And the rise of China. Asia is a much different place. It's a much more competitive place uh, than it was uh, in the days of Dulles and the original uh, San Francisco Treaty. Um, so the challenges for Japan in terms of competition, of course, are uh, considerably uh, later, uh, greater than they were. Also, the competition for attention uh, from other major nations in the world uh, as China rises, as the world globalizes, as Europe becomes more and more important. International relations, of course, are becoming more and more complex. As Mike has said also, of course, Japan has tremendous underlying strengths. Uh, but over history, um, one of its, uh, its conspicuous strength has been Int mostly internally uh, oriented, and its strengths have had to do with organization and consistency and stability uh, over time, rather than entrepreneurship and projection in, the, in a broader international system. That isn't to say that these can't be developed. Uh, those challenges, um, I firmly think Japan in the long run will be able to meet. Uh, but they do present uh, significant uh, challenges. Japan isn't the follower nation in technology nearly uh, to the extent that it, it formerly was. It needs to, to forge new pathways at the forefront of innovation uh, to a de greater degree uh, than it did. The United States market is not 40 percent of the world uh, the way it was when uh, the security treaty was uh, first signed. Um, China actually is a market about 30 percent larger for Japan um, uh, in terms of Japanese exports today than the American market is. Of course, it's not nearly as profitable. Of course, uh, the technology relationship of our two countries uh, secured by the intellectual property protection that both of our countries um, uh, hold, hold closely uh, is a great strength. There are many strengths in the relationship, but there's a tremendous transformation uh, in the world uh, that Japan faces uh, surrounding it, um, which is to suggest, in my mind, not the impossibility of um, a powerful Japan, a, a Japan which contributes in crucial ways to the world and to the United States, but rather the importance of activism, activism on the part of Japan and also of those countries um, who value its, its role in, in the world, an activism that will allow it to meet uh, these very uh, significant uh, cha uh, challenges that it does uh, face. That comes, that brings us to uh, uh, the issue, of course, of leadership. And, uh, and political stability. Um, in history, of course, and a rapidly growing economy for many years gave Japan a stable political system, one party dominance uh, for uh, close to half a century. Uh, it did have its pluses and its minuses both, but it provided a stability that also allowed and, and supported very rapid economic growth within a, uh, a stable context of the U.S.-Japan alliance and an international system that was rather stable in many ways. That stability, uh, as we've seen in the last decade in terms of, of continuing leadership, uh, has begun to erode. Um, we're, we've moved from a one-party dominance into a more fluid political system. Um, 
that challenge, the challenge of leadership, uh, is, is standing there uh, for Japan. Uh, many uh, articulate and thoughtful young leaders that we both know um, can help to overcome this problem. But as we discuss the future of Japan, it does seem to me the question of leadership is there. Um, related to other questions such as the electoral system, uh, such as how stability uh, can be maintained uh, in an era when uh, compensation, when uh, financial benefits, subsidies of all sorts of all kinds that used to be the basis on which stability could be maintained, that uh, those things are no longer possible. So in conclusion, I would say, yes, Japan has faced a terrible challenge. Japan has uh, faced that test in the U.S.-Japan relationship through o Operation Tomodachi and the broader outreach of our two countries has passed uh, a test with flying colors in the short run. That said, the heritage of history can't be ignored. Japan has lived in a uh, stable uh, US-centric world that is being challenged by a range of uh, broad global forces. Um, and the um, question is how our countries uh, will confront and, and overcome the challenges uh, that they face. I'm confident uh, that they will. Traditionally, Japan has been uh, resilient in crisis, but hopefully it won't take another crisis to bring the sort of innovation that Japan and its relationship to the world needs. Thank you. Uh, good. Now uh, we get to uh, the uh, question and answer part of our, of our fine program. Madam, you have the first question. Thank you. My name is Inla Niewald, and I'm from the Osgood Center of International Studies. My question is, what are the long-term effects of the nuclear industry of the Fukushima Daiichi incident? Thank you. In the very long term, it will be difficult for Japan to avoid some reliance on nuclear power. Uh, as we've said, 30 percent of um, power capacity is nuclear today. and. Um, most of the plant, and, and the issue is going to face Japan in a big way, I think, in the next decade, because more than half of those plants uh, were originally uh, constructed during the decade of the 1970s. Um, that, of course, was the decade of the, uh, the oil shocks. And Japan uh, had been growing very rapidly and was expecting to continue to grow rapidly and desperately needed power. And, uh, e and energy prices were rising rapidly. But it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, Japan to do the kind of capital investments that would be required um, with nuclear power. And also, of course, the political opposition, given the specter of Fukushima is there. So I think there's a tremendous, um, it's probably likely that you will see uh, after a certain interval, um, many of the existing plants revived for five or 10 years, but uh, when they come to their end of their useful life, Japan is going to have to move heavily to other things. And I think it will probably be um, LNG more than, than anything else, combined cycle LNG. But alternative energy, uh, we're facing a tremendous transformation in Japanese energy in the next decade. Personally, and I, you know, we're speculating here, personally, I think in 10 to 20 years, Japan actually will still keep 20, 25 percent of its energy nuclear. And the, re and the reason is um, Japan has a three-week supply, emergency supply of LNG, three weeks. Um, oil, it's three months. You can't store LNG as long. It's not stable and safe to do. Um, you know, that's an awfully thin reed uh, to rely on. And, and renewables, wind, solar, the Japanese government 
ambitiously at one point said we'll go to 20% renewables, but most economists I've talked to think that's just not economically feasible. It's going to be maybe 10%, mm -hmm. maybe 15 at most. So I, I personally think nuclear will be a, still an important part of the equation, although the politics are going to be tough. Mm -hmm. And the one reason, I think this is important actually for the U.S., because in 20, 30 years, um, who's going to be providing nuclear power plants to the world? You know, China's going to build 50 nu nuclear power plants. There are probably one to 300 being planned around the world, nuclear power plants. So who's going to provide those? Is it going to be the U.S., Japan, France, or is it going to be Russia, India, China? The safety standards, the nonproliferation concerns are going to be very, very different. I think it's important for Japan to be in the nuclear business, in part to help set the rules internationally. Okay. I'm a student from China and studying American University. So, so my question is that, as we know, China and Japan have a very good relationship in business, but not in politics. So I wonder the rise of China will bring more contribution to the recovery of Japan or be detrimental to Japan's economy. So that's my question. Thank you. I guess what I would say, first of all, is we shouldn't forget the production networks linking China, uh, Japan, and in some ways Korea as well. Um, Korea, or Japan is a tremendous exporter of high technology components, and China, of course, assembles uh, and also innovates as well, but assembles many of the products uh, produced with those uh, components. Um, of course, a large number of Chinese students large number of Chinese uh, tourists visiting Japan lately. In Tokyo, you see far more Chinese tourists than you know, tourists from anywhere else. Uh, another point that I guess that I would add, I, not depreciating certainly the geopolitical uh, tensions, but um, on the historical front, we've had joint textbooks uh, produced now uh, by the three uh, uh, governments by the three countries, scholars of the three countries. Uh, we've got a generational change. We're now six, 60 years and more since the war. That isn't to say that those issues have disappeared, but it does seem to me at various levels, uh, apart from sort of geopolitical, there are a lot of positive trends uh, within, within the region. I, as often happens when Ken and I are in these things together, I agree, but I'm going to slightly uh, um, accentuate the negative because <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there are some concerning trends, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, right. um, everybody's trade relations with China are growing. I mean, China is now the largest trading partner for Korea, for Australia, for us, except for Canada. So, I mean, the trend towards trade with China is growing. But if you look at public opinion polls, there's an inverse relationship between how much countries in Asia, but also in Europe, in North America, how much they trade with China and what the public, whether the public trusts China. And so we're in a very odd time in history where, in a sense, there's growing interdependence, growing trade, and increasing anxiety and threat perception. And so for international relations experts, this is a smorgasbord of theoretical confusion and, and explanations, mm -hmm. and it keeps professors employed. <laughs> um, and I don't know how it will come out, but there are some negative trends that are worth watching. Um, the PLA is in, in, in the process of implementing the so-called Near Sea Doctrine, which essentially means that they want to be able to operate in the first and even beyond to the second island chain, the, the islands off of China, which takes you out to Guam and quite far. Um, and there are at least five Chinese maritime services, Coast Guard, Fishery Police, that are competing for resources and are quite aggressively pushing out in this region. So even yesterday, or the day before, I guess, a Japanese Coast Guard uh, vessel was cut off by a Chinese survey ship that was heavily armed. And these things are happening in, in this whole uh, sea lane area, which is so vital to Japan. So the, the, the interdependence is increasing and the points of friction are increasing. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's pretty hard to know how to manage that if you're in policy. Um, and uh, it's a challenge for the U.S. too, because Japan's our ally, but cooperation with China is important. Um, and I think that challenge for us, for Japan, for other neighbors of China is going to get even more complicated because the domestic politics in every country, including China, are becoming more fluid. I'm not predicting we're going to have a war or conflict, but it, we are in this strange period where the positive and the negative are both increasing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my name is Steve Davis. I'm a member of the uh, World Affairs Council. Some years ago, I read a novel by Yukio Mishima 
named the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. He was concerned about the destruction of the Japanese character post-World War II. From what your observations are in interacting closely with the people, uh, it seems that you see the order, the discipline, the strength, um, the organizational skills are still very much the bedrock of the Japanese identity. Would you comment on that, please? This has been the perennial problem for Japan and one that Japan has almost always solved well, which is how do you retain the essence, the Japanese word is kokutai, the essence of what it is to be Japanese, the, the imperial system, um, the, the cultural and organizational aspects of what it is to be Japanese. How do you protect that? The Japanese answer was you modernize and open. You bring in Western institutions. You, you change in order to maintain the essence of what it is to be Japanese. The Chinese answer in the 19th century was you don't, and, and China had a bad century. Um, um, and it's having a much better century now. Um, so uh, this is a tricky problem. You know, some commentators who oppose trade agreements, oppose them on these grounds, will lose the essence of what it is to be Japanese, and they have a point. But I would just point out that historically, Japan has always historically found a way to modernize, reform, and open when necessary, when they have to, precisely in order to continue and preserve the, uh, the essence of what Japan's society is. There's a relationship here to, and you mentioned Mi Mishima. I'm sure that this is something probably that Mishima would have, have mentioned. Um, it seems to me, as we move beyond the post-war era, of course, after the war, there are so many ways that the United States aided and uh, allowed Japan to rebuild and has supported it and continues to support it over the years. I think, um, of course, we have cooperated in so many ways here. I think, once again, is why the kind of cooperation we got in Operation Tomodachi, uh, responding to crisis in various ways, is, is important. And also sensitivity, re reciprocity in the alliance. Um, the, uh, it went in the wrong dire direction when a, pr a Prime Minister Hatoyama was talking about Taito Namichibe Kanke, you know, the, the notion of a more equitable alliance. There are symmetries, of course, just by the nature of the relationship. You know, one nation is larger than the other one is dominant in the international system. But that issue of creating sp sufficient space for, for Japan, it seems to me, uh, in, the, in the relationship and in the alliance is something important. Gentlemen, uh, this has been an extraordinary session. Uh, Kent, Mike, I thank you enormously for uh, giving us such uh, thoughtful presentations, for answering questions uh, with such an interesting uh, set of views. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in expressing gratitude to our two wonderful speakers? Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.